How's it going, peeps? Welcome back to Viva La Coin. I am Joe. I will be your host for today's episode. And boy, do we have a ton to unpack. And this is actually my third time attempting to film this because my laptop charger decided to shit the bed. So I'm just going to run through it all again because I care about bringing the correct information to you instead of me just saying, oh, Bitcoin's going to a million dollars or the bull runs over and everything's going to burn to the ground. It's usually not as clear cut as that. And I did some time and some digging into all the different things that were going on. And I wanted to wait a day or two since this weekend to post this video. So then that way I'm not giving you bits and pieces or snippets of information that might not even be entirely correct. Um, as we go through this, I'm going to point out which uh, portions of this dump and what caused it do I think are actually uh, serious or, or applicable. And then for some other ones, I'm going to break down as to why I do not think that they matter as much. However, what you're going to find is that usually when we see a dip or if something goes wrong, it's because there's a, a big announcement or bad news or FUD, fear, doubt, or you know, just a, a little bit of dissent coming from people that do not like Bitcoin. However, we had several, and I'm talking five or six massive things occur simultaneously on top of having our own internal greed and leverage stacked against, uh, against us in the crypto space um, that came back to basically shoot us in the foot. So I'm gonna be pointing out all of those different things and giving my thoughts as to what may come next in both a good or a bad scenario so that as this all unfolds, you can take the proper action that you need to to make sure that you're taking care of your investments and your money the best ways possible. Again, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not an oracle. I'm not a private detective. I'm not a fucking wizard. This is all just information that I've tried to gather uh, over time and just bring to you. To, so that you can make your best decisions, but obviously do your own additional research before making uh, any decisions. So we have a ton to cover. So I'm just gonna jump into the video um, right away. So if we look at what is going on, and of course my computer wants to fight me every step of the way. If we look at what was going on with Bitcoin right now, so Bitcoin is sitting at $55,000. But if you remember my last couple videos, we were running up. Uh, we were pushing towards that 65K mark um, all the way from a low earlier in the month, uh, around 50K, almost cracked that 50, uh, 65K spot. And then all of a sudden we started going down and we had this massive 10K drop from $61,000 all the way down to just sub 51,000, uh, right around $50,931. And this happened very quickly. This is only on the 15 minute chart. So most of that dropped within the matter of half an hour. So there were a series of different things that led up to this, but the reason why it's important to always stay on top of your knowledge base when it comes to crypto and what is happening is because when it dips, it dips fast it plummets. And the same thing with those pumps. You, if you miss a pump, the next thing you know, some crypto goes parabolic and hits 300%. So it's always nice to stay informed and make your decisions based on not just fear or panic, you know, never panic sell and never run into green candles. Um, you know, the, the same bullshit I always tell you guys. But in this case, there were a series of different things that led to this dip. And uh, I believe that you also had a perfectly timed uh, sell-off in, in beginning of that dump from the whales, from the major institutions or whoever else has been trying to dump uh, Bitcoin's price. They didn't necessarily have to dump it on their own. They just had to light the match that set the forest on fire because uh, there was enough bad news out there to begin with. So the first thing I'm going to cover is the first story that actually came out which was Turkey officially bans cryptocurrency payments. So Turkey's central bank cited excess volatility and lack of regu uh, regulations as the reason for the ban. And as stated, the central bank of the Republic of Turkey cited a number of reasons for the ban, including a lack of supervision mechanisms and central authority regulation for crypto assets. It says the market values can be excessively volatile adding that the digital wallets can be stolen, used unlawfully, and that transactions were irrevocable. So 
you know, it, this isn't the first time that we've seen a country attempt to ban cryptocurrency. Typically, it blows back in their face. And usually, it has to do with them maintaining a certain amount of power in a failing currency that they use already in their country. So let's look at when we talk about price volatility and purchasing power and protecting the citizens of your country. Just a month ago, the Turkish lira fell 15% after their bank governor was sacked. And they've been having issues with their own native currency for some time now. So they're all shocked in their own country and it's causing massive issues and fluctuations with their own native currency. So what do people do? They turn to Bitcoin and they were purchasing cryptocurrency higher than ever in Turkey at that time. So if you're a country where your currency is shitting the bed, uh, so to speak, you're not going to want to further push it downward by having everyone take that failing currency and put it into an actual appreciating functional asset. Um, so them putting that ban up isn't necessarily so that people can't purchase crypto. They just can't use it for its intended purposes in any type of transactions or pay anyone with it or use it uh, in its utility. So do I think that that will be a long-lived uh, ban? No, I do not. The same countries of India and Nigeria that just said, oh, we're going to ban it. Now they're working on, oh, well, how can we put regulations in place so that people can use it? Because they understand that if they ban it, people will buy it and use it anyway. And will likely either leave the country or it's, it's just going to cause more damage to them in the long run. So this was story number one. Do I think that this would cause Bitcoin to fall $10,000 in 30 minutes? Absolutely not. But then we stack up. What I believe to be the most prominent of any of these stories, which was Bitcoin's hash rate dropped over 45% as massive rolling blockouts in China took out a bunch of the mining pools that helped secure the Bitcoin network. Now, I've seen several reports where that's closer to 30 to 40%. Um, I'll probably say 40% is right around where the most consistent number is. However, the hash rate is if you remember back to my what is Bitcoin video, we're talking about blockchain, you have all these different networks in computers and mining pools, securing the Bitcoin network, pushing the ledger flew, uh, through, generating the blocks and so on. Well, China has had the largest mining pools and the biggest mining share for some time. Now, you could be like the United States government and look in the mirror and just say, oh, this isn't my fault because I decided not to take part in cryptocurrency. This is their fault for being too proactive. However, all I think that this shows is it is a cautionary warning that we need to spread that mining um, pool delegation out. We need to get more mining hash power in the U.S. We need other countries to step up to take a little bit of that percentage away from China, not because I believe that they're going to just nefariously shut it all down, but because you don't want that hash rate going down. If there is another natural disaster, I believe this one was caused by like coal mining fires or something that started it off and then you had the rolling blackouts. But I think that this is just a precautionary warning to be a little bit more proactive and move out those mining pools and spread it around to different parts of the world. Um, but I think that this would have the most impact on the price of everything that occurred. Um, but just this in and of itself, I don't think that it would have gave us that flash crash and drag us down by 10K in almost an hour. So what else was occurring? Well, and I just pulled up this graphic. This is just showing that the block interval times of how long it takes to generate the blocks and what Bitcoin's um, you know, pause was in between, it increased significantly during that period. Now, since then, the hash rate is back up and everything is fine. But I do want to point out that I, I am a little bit concerned about that. And I think that it's not like a oh, bull run is over and Bitcoin will fail type of thing. But I, I do think that we need to be more proactive about it. And we can do that by getting out of our own motherfucking way in this country and just start to incorporate crypto a little bit more than what we have been. Um, now, the next story, so Jerome Powell, who is part of the Fed over here that oversees um, the, the banks and everything. So Bitcoin cryptocurrencies recover from sharp decline, power blackout in China, transfers from wallets, you know, recent regulations, among other reasons uh, for the pullback. 
And the only reason why I pulled this up is on top of all these things already beginning to unfold, Jerome Powell came out and he was talking about cryptocurrency and stated, well, you know, I, I believe that there are vehicles for speculation and they're not really being actively used as payments. And that was last Wednesday, but then all of a sudden, all these articles started kicking that quote back out again. And they're like, see, look, I told you, now the hash rate is down and all oh, it's all speculation and everything's gonna crash and the bull run is over. So everyone republished this story and that quote and threw it all out, uh, out there. Um, I do believe that I'm not a tinfoil hat person when I say that there is a concentrated effort to put this uh, negative media out there as things start to look like they may dip because they know that's just fuel on the fire. So you have that. Then on top of that, you have all of retail led by our favorite degenerates and Wall Street bets um, start pumping Dogecoin. So Dogecoin um, just started pumping up through the roof and I'll actually show you over on their chart. Um, just over the course of the last week, Dogecoin had a massive run up and we're talking, it went from all the way down April 3rd, we were still at five cents. We popped all the way up to a high of around 44 cents. Let me pull this over a little bit further so that we can get a clear picture. So a high all the way up around 40 cents is what coin market cap has, but it was up to around 44 cents. Now, then we had a dip down and then a correction back up. And I believe that there just will be further dips, but everyone else that doesn't really lean more into the investment utility side, but just sees that pump up, that was because in my last video, I mentioned Wall Street Bets now allowed them to discuss cryptocurrencies on their Reddit pages. And the three that they were allowed to talk about was Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin. Dogecoin being the cheapest, Dogecoin being a meme shitcoin, uh, obviously they jumped at the chance to pump that and they did. They shot it all the way through the roof. And oftentimes, by the time people started buying in, it was already around that 30 to 40 cent range where people started dumping it and taking profits. So now we started a 420 initiative um, for all the crypto fans wanting to turn weed day into doge day and everyone's pushing this on Twitter to try and push doge up to a dollar. And it's not just like the shit posters and Reddit people and Wall Street bets. You have full on companies like Snickers uh, getting on board saying, guess what day it is? Hashtag Doge Day tomorrow, hashtag Doge Day 420. Um, and they, they were doing some spoof marketing with Doge. So yeah, that's all cool. Everyone can rally around a meme coin. And if they want to pump that up and you know get caught at the top holding the bags or lose their money or some may profit, that's good. If you made a ton of money in Doge, I'm so happy for you. However, what I do want you to understand is that that pump and dump is eventually going to crash back down. And when anyone's looking externally at our market with an already very charged view of a group such as Wall Street Bets and what they just did in traditional finance and the stock market, most traditional finance people do not like Wall Street Bets. I personally, I love them. However, now that same sentiment is spilling over to, oh, look, now they're pumping and dumping cryptocurrencies and it's this joke shit coin that Dogecoin was worth $50 billion. It was wor worth more than some banks in total. Um, and everyone's like, see, look, crypto's a joke. So it, it really put a lot of people on edge uh, as far as, well, is that gonna crash? Is that our sign of market euphoria? when retail investors come in and pump everything so parabolically that we have nothing to do but to crash like we did at the end of the last couple bull cycles. And I believe that euphoria is being confused with a very calculated pump and dump on Doge. And I just think that that was one more log on the fire to burn leading up to this massive dip. The next thing that we had was them just talking about the absolute total that was wiped um, from the actual market. And I just pulled this up just to show, I mean, it was $300 billion was wiped out. And one of the tweets that led to that in my next story was this tweet. And I know it's a little bit small and that's because guess what? The fucking tweet was deleted after this circulated all over the world and everyone was talking about it. Whoever put this up deleted the tweet. But it came from FX Hedge and it said U.S. Treasury to charge several financial institutions for money laundering using cryptocurrencies by sources. 
wow, that by sources, that seems very, um, you know, in depth. Thank you for providing your sources. So I know that this tweet probably has no merit because A, the U.S. Treasury doesn't charge anyone uh, for money laundering. That would be the DOJ. And there was a, a lawyer that does a lot of crypto stuff that actually pointed that out. And um, he's Jake Trevinsky, Jay Trevinsky on Twitter. If you ever want to know more about the legal side of crypto, go follow him. But he said, I do not find, and you can see this, <laughs> this tweet is now unavailable. Fucking hilarious. I don't find this credible. This tweet itself is fishy. Treasury doesn't charge money laundry. DOJ does. And a case against several financial institutions at once would be unusual. Also, criminal investigations are kept strictly confidential and rarely leak. I'm not convinced by unnamed quote-unquote sources. And I think he hit the nail on the head because that tweet was deleted and we've received no additional information. But again, when you start having the hash rate drop and you have Turkey banning Bitcoin uh, transactions and everyone's pumping and dumping Doge, then you throw that tweet out and let the media get their hands on that and everyone starts circulating it around. Now you have a bonfire with extra logs in a whirlwind and we're just going to keep dumping the gasoline on it. So what happened next? So the next thing that everyone was talking about was the Coinbase uh, corporate shares that were sold on opening day. So Coinbase CEO sold 291.8 million in shares on opening day. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Coinbase insiders and early investors sold about $5 billion in shares during the total uh, or, or in total during the leading cryptocurrency exchanges first day of trading on the NASDAQ earlier this week, according to a series of filings made on Friday with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. So their CEO sold about 750,000 shares. Um, their, one of their additional members sold almost 5 million shares. Um, another one of their individuals that is a VC firm uh, sold almost 5 million uh, there are other engineers and people sold off a significant amount. And everyone's saying, look, Coinbase hypes all this up for them to go public in this IPO. And then look, they, they pump up their price, get all this hype and FOMO and fear of missing out on Coinbase in. And then they dump all their shares on the people and crypto's a scam. And here's another example. Well, <clears throat> what you need to understand about this uh, IPO is it was a direct listing. So... For their company going public, so Coinbase, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the U.S., becomes public uh, today with the ticker coin. The company has a skewed a traditional uh, initial public offering. Instead, it plans to post its shares <clears throat> straight to the NASDAQ stock exchange uh, in a so-called direct listing, a technique pioneered by big names like Spotify and Palantir in recent years. So... I pulled up even by definition so I can read it to you. The major difference between a direct listing and an IPO is that one sells existing shop, uh, stocks while the other issues new stock shares. So in a direct listing, the employees and the corporate officials or any investors, they, they sell their existing stocks to the public. In a pure IPO, a company sells part of the company by using new stocks that they issue or create so the public can buy. So Coinbase and all of its corporate officials would have to sell off some of their stocks so the public could actually buy them in this initial public offering. So I don't think that that's like earth shattering 10 grand in lost Bitcoin price news but everyone spinning it out uh, in a way where they didn't understand what a direct listing was or that they had to sell some of those shares because they didn't reorganize them or issue new ones prior to going public. Um, that just threw more fuel into that uh, fire torna tornado that we were essentially stuck in between. So now what happened? And this is the, the granddaddy of all the fuck-ups that led us to where we are and the only people that we can point to or the members of the crypto community. So crypto futures sorry, saw a record $10 billion worth of liquidations on Sunday. So in, in all of this leading up to the Coinbase IPO, Bitcoin looks, uh, it was looking like it was about to press towards 70K and everyone's getting excited. Oh, okay, you know, here we go to the moon. Altcoin season is starting. People get greedy. I do not trade. 
right? I, I will swap out positions. I will hold positions. I will sell some for profit and move it elsewhere, but I do not long and short. I do not use derivatives or leverage. I do not multiply into money I do not have, but greed and gambling is a hell of a drug. And there were so many people that were so overly leveraged. They, they were using 50 to, uh, up to 100 times leverage at some points on their crypto bets. So they would make more money if it went the direction that they wanted it to. That we wiped out about $10 billion worth of positions in just a, a single, single night. So for me, when we look at this chart, and it's from Bybit, but if we look at the overall um, totals, if this will load, so total liquidations, we are not even close to these other days, these other flash crashes where we had liquidations. This candle over on the far right hand side here, if you can see this and my face isn't blocking it, that makes everything else look like absolute like child's play. That is how much money was lost. And if you think about a couple of videos ago, I mentioned that there were different banks that used uh, research to find out that it takes about uh, $93 million or so to move the price of Bitcoin by 1% or something like that. And then you still have a bunch of people buying, but if you wipe out $10 billion worth of positions and all that starts to cascade down, that is when you get into this nightmare scenario. You start triggering one liquidation after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next, and it creates that flash crash. And that's because we were too greedy, too over leveraged, and there were too many people too long um, and too hyped up about Bitcoin only going up, only going to the moon. We couldn't possibly crash. That through a combination of a series of external events, plus a perfectly timed uh, dump coming from the same people that have been dumping, set in motion those dominoes to fall and push us off the edge of the cliff. So that is what I believe led to the dump. And now we're back in kind of this holding pattern in between 54 and 56K in almost like a descending channel uh, at this point. But if we can break above 57, 57.5, according to most technical analysis that I've watched, um, we should be able to get back above um, where we need to be to start moving upwards. If we do break down and we get below that 52K, 52.5 mark, um, I do believe that 47K would be our next target to bounce from. That's where a lot of institutions bought in previously. That's where we had a lot of idling around before we moved up and finally broke 50K. I think that there's a lot of good support there. Uh, and then if we broke that, it would go probably down to around 41K. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen. All I'm saying is, depending on where we go in this channel, um, we're going to have to rely on the previous supports that we've had, either at 47K, probably 50K as far as the psychological level goes, but I believe 47 is, is the better bet. And then if we go up, we got to punch back through that 57.5 and then start climbing from there. And I can already see it. People are right back to being over leveraged. People are diving into Doge and throwing money around. People are not taking this as seriously as they should because for the first time since October, we closed a daily candle under the 50-day moving average, which is not a good sign at all. Um, now, does that mean the bull run is over? Absolutely not. But it does mean that we are in very hot water at the moment, having closed that underneath. And you can see on this daily chart, if I pull it all the way back out, um, we've pretty much been above that um, for a long, long time. Actually, the last one, it looks like we closed under that 50-day moving average. If I can pull this over, was all the way back, uh, man, yeah, like back in October. So that's what this red line is, that 50-day moving average. So it's not a good look. Now, could it have been a culmination of everything occurring that we can bounce back from and everything will be fine? Uh, possibly. I, I think that it was a perfect storm of different events that occurred and doesn't necessarily wipe out all the momentum, public sentiment, uh, international focus, or big money flowing into crypto. But what it does serve as is a warning to everyone when it does come to investing. Do not over leverage. Do not 
to take out credit or multiply your loans and try and just shoot for the moon because if you expect Bitcoin just to breeze on up to 100K and beyond, you're lying to yourself. We're going to hit resistance. We're going to have hiccups. There are going to be things that set us back. And we want to be able to not only be prepared for that, but you know, not add more pain and suffering to that battle by losing a bunch of money in liquidations. That's the last thing I want to see. Now, the final thing I'm going to point out is this just came out uh, yesterday. So Wall Street banks brace for digital dollars as the next big disruptive force. And this was on CNBC. And I almost had to like just hold my breath until my brain cells started to die to start to think, huh, the next big disruptive force would be digital dollars. It's not crypto. The, the thing that has central finance essentially on its heels, panicking, trying to both buy it and offer it to their clients while telling everyone else that it's a scam. But digital dollars are the next big disruptive force. So Wall Street banks view central bank digital currencies as the next big financial disruptor. Countries uh, as large as China and as small as the Bahamas have instituted these digital currencies. I talked about the digital yuan. In the U.S., the Federal Reserve is taking a cautious approach, uh, though it has launched a project with MIT. So it, it's funny, when they talk about their own currency, when they talk about their own um, you know, thing that they can manipulate, that we can just create more of, that they can still control and have the power over, and then all of a sudden, that's the next big financial disruptor. Now, like that, in my opinion, this is bullshit. The next big financial disruptor is already globally taking place. This is a piss poor attempt at trying to keep up with countries that are years ahead of us, that we are going to continue to blame uh, for our own inability to see and look ahead. So that came out, and at the same time, China uh, just had this story come out. So breaking Li Bao or Li Bo, deputy governor of the Central Bank of China, said that crypto assets such as Bitcoin should be used as investment tools or alternative investments. This is the first time that the Chinese government has recognized the asset value of cryptocurrencies. So talk about just rubbing salt in the wound of the good, uh, good old U.S. of A. You have essentially completely beat them to the punch and you put your own digital currency out. You have them essentially choking on their own inability to find a way to regulate it while their own fear of losing their greed and power is stopping us from doing anything, from clearing ETFs, from setting up these mining uh, facilities to get that hash rate spread out. And then what, we're, we're going to rush to where everyone else already is at and that's like the great disruptor? Uh, no, when I told people previously, you know, even before this whole year took place that the US dollar was on its last leg and on its way out, everyone said, well, Joe, you're actually an insane person. And, and I said, no, like, I'm not saying that I want the US dollar to collapse. And I'm not saying that I want it to pull, just poof and, and go up in, in smoke. What I'm saying is we are losing our seat as the World Federal Reserve because we are printing trillions of dollars backed by nothing that everyone else is fucking tethered to since we are the reserve currency. And people are done. There is an off-ramp of the US dollar in crypto and their own digital currencies. And we are digging our own grave, assuming that everyone's gonna stop the train and wait for us, the very country who landed everyone in these waters to begin with. So all in all, I, I know it's not like the best exciting news video, right? No one wants to talk about the bad side of things or possibly consolidating or dropping down in, into the 40s again. But I want to point out what's going on behind the scenes, why I think all of that has occurred, and ultimately wh where I feel like the, the biggest fear for me was and what stuff I thought was bullshit. Ultimately, in my opinion, my non-financial, non-private investigator um, qualified opinion, I don't think the bull run is done. I think that this serves as a very intense, almost avoidable shakeout I think that we could have went a little bit higher and then shook everyone out if we if we dipped from like 80 down to 58K and wrecked a bunch of people there. However, it, it needed to happen. We need to stop being so over leveraged. We need to stop being greedy. We need to stop panic selling and just seeing a headline and dumping everything and assuming it's over. We also need to stop never taking a single thing off the table because we're gonna put it all on Doge and let it ride up into the sun. 
Um, it, we, we need to have a more grounded, unbiased perspective as to why things are happening and, and what is leading us from point A to point B. Because if we don't know that, then we're not going to know the best places to enter. We're not going to know the best places to exit. And we're essentially going to be led on a ride by a bunch of more powerful, more wealthy people than us that have already either been in this space or are going to attempt to hijack it. So aside from that, I hope this was uh, valuable. If it was, please like the video, share it to whoever else, or even if you have differing opinions or something that you think maybe I got wrong or you wanna have a discussion about, please, I I'm open to the comments. I by no means am I omnipotent. I do not know everything. I cannot see the future. So I'm happy to have those conversations and I appreciate you for sticking around to the end. Uh, as always, I am honored that you joined us on this episode of Viva La Coin and I will catch you guys next time.